All right. So you should see my screen. And hopefully we'll uh, get started here. All right, Frank's the only face I can see. Can you give me a thumbs up, Frank, if you can see my screen okay? All right, so we're here to talk about winter hummingbirds. Um, I thought I'd started out with this uh, video of a hummingbird in the snow, um, something that you don't see every day. Uh, you don't see a lot in Louisiana, either the snow or the hummingbirds in the snow. Uh, but this was actually taken uh, right out my front door in Baton Rouge a few years ago during one of our infrequent snowstorms. And uh, we're going to talk about um, these, little, these little guys and how they handle the winter. So we're going to do some background uh, for just a few minutes and talk about hummingbirds in general. Uh, you're probably aware that the hummingbird is the smallest bird in the world. Um, this bird on the left here, the bee hummingbird, is actually the smallest bird in the world. It's just over two inches long. Um, this is actually a photo that I took in Cuba when I went to visit um, and see some of the endemic birds of Cuba in 2019 on one of the trips that David mentioned. Uh, so even though he's only two inches, he's just as feisty as any hummingbird that you're going to come across. Uh, of course, not all hummingbirds are small. Uh, but this is the giant hummingbird, which is the largest hummingbird. It's about the size of a cardinal. And it occurs at high elevations in the Andes Mountains of Peru. Um, this photo is actually by Matt Brady, which for some of you are familiar with. Uh, hummingbirds are all American birds. And what I mean by that is that they only occur in the Americas. So North America, Central America, and South America. Uh, there are over 30, 340 species of hummingbirds. They come in all shapes and sizes, um, but they occur mostly in the tropics near the equator. Uh, in warmer climates. Um, but somewhere back there in evolutionary history, one of these little hummingbirds that uh, evolved in the tropics decided that it was going to travel for thousands of miles to the north uh, to breed. And that one, of course, is our ruby-throated hummingbird. So this is the most common hummingbird in the eastern part of the U.S. The male, of course, is named for that ruby-red gorget or throat um, feathers. He has dark tail feathers. The female that you see down here has a clear throat and green back with white tips on the tail. The immature male will have the white on the front, the green on the back, white tips on the tail, but also have some, um, uh, have a little bit of a five o'clock shadow where the gorget is starting to grow in and you can see some spots on the gorget. And then we have this guy. People see this one in their yard and they think they have something other than a ruby-throated hummingbird um, because it doesn't have a red throat. But the ruby throat does not always look red. So as you can see, as this guy moves his head back and forth, you can see the throat um, shining in the, the light. And sometimes when the light is not shining on it, it's dark. So, the reason for that is that that red is not pigment uh, like a cardinal's feathers. It's actually the color comes from the structure of the feathers and the way that the light is reflected and refracted into our eye. And he can control how much red we see. Uh, so he uses that uh, to signal um, to, his, um, to his enemies and also to his love interests uh, as a part of his breeding display. Hummingbirds, of course, are amazing flyers. Um, they beat their wings between 50 and 70 times a second. So in the time it takes to say one Mississippi, they have moved their wings 50 to 70 times, which is just incomprehensible. Uh, they move their wings instead of up and down like most birds, they move them in a figure eight shape, which allows them to fly forward, backward, upside down, and hover for long periods of time. And they do perch and sit still. In fact, they spend most of their time perching, although they're pretty good at camouflaging, so we often don't see them when they're sitting still. But they cannot walk. Um, so it's a good thing that they're very good flyers. So when we think about what hummingbirds eat, what immediately comes to mind is nectar or sugar water. Um, but they are actually fly catchers. So they eat insects and small spiders. When I first started birding, I thought their bill was like a straw and they just sucked up nectar, but they can actually open their bill just like other birds. 
Um, bill is like tweezers. Um, they have this extraordinary tongue that extends well past the end of the bill, and it has a special um, shape to it that allows it to slurp up the nectar. And speaking of that tongue, the tongue is so long that it can't fit in the mouth of a hummingbird. It actually wraps around inside the skull of the hummingbird. This little guy is a male calliope hummingbird that I met a few years back. And he was very docile, very willing to have this video taken. So of course they also eat nectar. Uh, they need sugar for energy to catch those insects. One bird might visit hundreds of flowers in a day. They prefer the flowers that are long and tubular, but of course they'll visit other flowers like zinnias or lantana that are fairly flat. Um, and our feeders to them are basically bottomless blooms. So they'll come visit the feeders over and over again, as long as they find something good to eat there. For as far as using feeders, uh, the very most important thing about using a feeder is to use one that is easy to clean. You want to hang your feeder in a visible location that is visible to you. The reason you're putting a feeder out is so you can see the birds. Um, maybe not in the full sun, but under a tree or an eave, um, somewhere where the birds can see it, but it's not in the sun because um, it will spoil faster if it's in the sun. You know that hummingbirds don't like to share. So most of the year, it's good to hang several feeders out of sight of each other. The exception would be like in this video during fall migration, uh, during the peak of fall migration, when you have so many birds coming through and they care more about fattening up for migration than they do about fighting. Uh, hummingbirds don't like each other, they don't like you, and there is nothing you can do about it. That is just their nature. So, and do remember that the birds don't need the feeders, they're not dependent upon our feeders. Um, the feeders are for us to see the birds. And the exception to that might be the winter hummingbirds that we're going to talk about in a minute. So in the feeder, you want to use one part sugar to four parts water. Just heat the water enough that you, uh, that you can melt the sugar, basically. You don't need to boil or sterilize anything. No red dye, no prefab mixes, uh, just sugar and water. And again, use an easy to clean feeder. This one is one I really like. Um, they sell at Walmart, it's called a First Nature Feeder. That bottom part comes completely apart so you can clean it in two pieces and the hole was big enough to get a regular scrub brush in. You wanna change the nectar every couple of days. In the summertime, it might be as often as every other day. In the winter, you might be able to go as long as a week. Hummingbirds are about the size of your thumb, at least most of the hummingbirds that we're gonna come across. Uh, and they normally weigh about as much as a penny, might, maybe just a little bit more, which is right at two and a half grams. Um, when they get ready for migration, they double their body weight and they get up to a hefty five grams. So the ruby-throated hummingbird winters in Mexico and in um, Central America, uh, many in Costa Rica. They head back to Louisiana and the Eastern US starting in February. Um, some of them will take the, the uh, route around the the Gulf of Mexico, and some will take that, that flyway right across the Gulf of Mexico, 600 miles, um, which requires at least an 18-hour flight if they've got a tailwind to help them along. Um, and of course, they land on the coast in places like our Vito Woods in, um, in Cameron Parish or Grand Isle. They're exhausted, they're hungry, they're thirsty, they're looking for something to eat. Um, but for the ones that are headed toward Canada, it's just a brief stop over in Louisiana before they head further north. And in the fall, of course, they do the reverse. Um, they generally leave the state by September or October uh, to go back to Mexico and Central America. So if this is true, if the hummingbird, the ruby throat is the most common hummingbird, uh, and the ruby throats leave by September and October, then why are we seeing hummingbirds in the winter? It's because they likely are not ruby-throated hummingbirds. So a percentage of ruby-throated hummingbirds do stay all winter, but most likely the birds that you're seeing after November 15th are going to be one of the Western species like this Rufus hummingbird. Um, this is a little immature male that was in my yard um, a couple of years ago. 
So, so far, 14 different species of hummingbird have been recorded in Louisiana. The most common are the ones on the left here, um, these seven, and then less common. In fact, there are only single records of some of these really fancy ones that are mostly Mexican um, hummingbirds. And if you are not familiar with the name Nancy Newfield, um, Nancy is really the, the grand dame of the winter hummingbird world in Louisiana and truly across the country. Um, she was the researcher. Um, she was not a, a professional ornithologist, um, but she noticed back in the 70s that, that hummingbirds were coming into her yard and spending the winter. Um, and she tried to get the attention of the ornithologists in the state, like the folks at the Museum of Natural History and um, Natural Science in Baton Rouge, and they basically were not interested. Um, the general thought at the time was that these winter hummingbirds were just lost and that they probably were going to die because they'd taken a, a, a hard left when they just should have gone right uh, and they weren't going to survive. Um, but she was seeing otherwise and she took it, uh, she took on the project of um, starting a banding project as originally supposed to be a five year project that's now in its 41st year. Uh, to start banding and researching and documenting these winter hummingbirds. Uh, so her website, you can see there, casacolibri.net. Uh, she's also written two books about hummingbirds and hummingbird gardening that I highly recommend. Um, both are out of print, but you can still find copies of these. And I would highly suggest that if you are into hummingbird gardening that you get copies of these books. So the male rufous, uh, the rufous hummingbird is one of the most common of our overwintering hummingbird species. Uh, this guy, an adult male rufous, you are not going to uh, mistake for a ruby-throated hummingbird. He looks completely different, a little redhead uh, with a rusty color, feathers, and then that, um, that goldy red uh, gorget. And, uh, it's about a little bit larger maybe than, um, than ruby throat, um, but not much. This is, again, the same little immature male rufus that was in my yard in Ponchatoula in January 2018. You can see the purple um, paint on his head. He had just been banded uh, by Linda Beal. So, and the reason that he's so puffy is because it was cold that day. So he's puffing up all of his feathers to try to trap air uh, to create a little down coat for himself to stay warm in the sun. The female rufus um, looks different than a ruby throat, other than the fact that the back is green. But if you'll see the sides are definitely this rufus color and she has a gorget. So unlike the female ruby throat um, that does not have a gorget, she will have a throat patch uh, generally uh, sort of round or triangular in the center of the throat. Um, it's not quite as bright as the male Rufus's gorget, but it's definitely noticeable. She also has green tail feathers, which is important when we're trying to tell them apart. So this is the, the range of the Rufus hummingbird. You can see they breed far to the west and the northwest, actually Pacific Northwest of the US and then up into British Columbia all the way up to Alaska. So the yellow is migration. And here, this is an eBird, um, a Cornell map that shows that they, they're recognizing that these birds not only winter in Mexico, but now regularly winter along the Gulf Coast and got a few spots here in other Southern states. One of the best ways to detect a rufus is to listen for it. So if you can hear that, a, a ruby-throated hummingbird sounds very sweet and chirpy. Um, the rufous hummingbird is very staccato. It sounds like two electric wires touching together. Um, it definitely sounds completely different. And I usually detect the first uh, rufous in my yard in the fall or the winter just by the sound alone. So. One thing that's a little tricky about the Rufus hummingbirds is that there's another one called a, an Allen's hummingbird. 
Uh, that is also a Western species that looks very, very similar to a rufous hummingbird. Um, you can see here that rufous is on the left, the Allen's on the right. If I took the labels off, you probably could not tell them apart. Um, so um, the, the rule of thumb is that if you have a little rusty hummingbird in your yard, you pretty much have to call it a Salaspora spa, a Salaspora species, or a rufous slash Allen's until you can figure out which it is. Um, and note too that the rufous outnumber the Allen's hummingbirds in Louisiana by 500 or 1,000 to one. So the Allen's hummingbirds are very rare. And this, um, this is a guideline to try to help you tell them apart. If you can get um, pictures of the tail when it's spread and often hummingbirds when they perch to preen um, they will stretch and they will um, flare their tail feathers and you might be able to get a, a photograph of the, the tail feathers. You'll notice that an adult male rufus has this little notch. This is called the R2 tail feather uh, where the Allen's does not. Uh, the Allen's other feathers are also thinner, narrower than the rufus. Um, but the best thing is to leave it, leave it to the experts. Uh, even Sherry Williamson, who wrote the book, book about hummingbirds of North America, will say that um, for an immature bird, um, really you, you know, having that bird in the hand during a banding session and taking measurements is the only definitive way to tell a rufus from an Allen's hummingbird. So um, one thing to note though, if you ha do have a rufus in your yard that is obviously not an adult male, but has green on the back and roof rust on the sides, uh, you might be able to tell if it's a male or, or a female by the tail feathers, because uh, the, the immature male will have rufus tail feathers where the immature female will have green. And then there are other Salasphorus um, hummingbirds. Oh, there's in the Salasphorus genus. This again is the Calliope hummingbird. Uh, this is actually, the Calliope is the smallest North American bird. So where the uh, bee hummingbird is the smallest bird in the world, this guy is the smallest in North America. The, um, the female uh, or an immature male calliope uh, tends to be not as rusty as the uh, female Rufus Allens. Uh, so the sides are, have a little bit of a buffy tone to them, but they're not as rusty Rufus as the, the uh, Rufus or the Allens. Um, and they kind of have a, have a pot bellied look and they have a very short tail. If you'll notice here, that the wings are actually longer than the tail, uh, which causes them to have a, a, a very hot bellied look. You can see in this video that that Remsen uh, just posted. This is a female calliope um, feeding in his yard and you can see how stout and pot bellied this, this bird looks, how short tailed. And they also have a short bill uh, relative to other hummingbirds. So all in all, they look very round and diminutive. Uh, and his note was that the calliope tends to stay low and kind of stay out of the way of the larger hummingbirds that might want to aggravate it. This is the, the range map for the calliope. This is pretty impressive, I have to say. So the calliope also um, nests uh, very far to the northwest uh, in the upper Rockies, um, different parts of the Pacific Northwest and up into British Columbia and winters down in Western Mexico. Um, so for vagrants to show up in Louisiana is quite something. If you end up with a female hummingbird in your yard, um, you may be hard put to tell them apart. Uh, it is difficult because they're, they're all gonna be kind of greenish on the back and pale on the front. Um, this, you might be able to guess um, just from what I just said about the calliope, but this one is the calliope, uh, which it is indeed, got the shorter bill, the shorter tail, kind of a round, stout little bird. The black chin tends to have a longer bill than even the ruby throat, and the bill tends to have kind of a decurve to it. 
these two are really tough to tell apart. And then just when you think you have this elastomerous genus figured out, you get one that doesn't quite match everything that you knew about elastomerous hummingbirds, uh, like this one that showed up in Gail Superbiel's yard um, last week, I believe. And it turned out to be a broad-tailed hummingbird. Uh, so this is an even more unusual visitor to Louisiana. Um, not many records in the years that we have a good showing of winter hummingbirds. Uh, she was able to get a really good picture of the, the tail spread of this hummingbird, which showed that the central tail feathers were indeed all green. And the rufus is confined to the first tail feathers, um, very broad tail feathers, um, which allowed uh, Eric Johnson to determine that it was a, um, a broad-tailed hummingbird. And it basically looks like a slightly larger, paler rufus-type hummingbird. And here's the range for the broad-tailed hummingbird, um, very much confined to the Rocky Mountain area and the desert, high desert for breeding. And then again, down to Southern Mexico, uh, even into Central America for the winter. This year um, has been exceptionally good for broad-tailed hummingbirds already in Louisiana. So one of the, the second most common probably after the rufus is our the black chinned hummingbird. Um, this is an Archilochus in the same genus as the ruby throat. Um, and here we have the adult male. So unlike the male uh, ruby throat, whose gorget turns completely red, the male black chinned keeps this black in the, the upper part of the gorget under his chin and just has this LSU purple collar around his neck. Um, so, and then the immature male as he starts getting those gorget feathers, you might see a little bit of a purple spotting on the lower part of his throat. Uh, the female will be just green on the back and white on the front, like a ruby throated hummingbird. But the bill tends to be longer and a little bit decurved, unlike the straight bill of the ruby throat. Here we see a male, adult male ruby throat, and an adult male black chinned. Um, without the color of their gorget showing, and you can see that they really are almost identical. Um, so you have other subtle differences. The shape of the primary feathers on the wing differ a little bit. Uh, the length and the slight decurve of the bill might be a clue that it's black chin as opposed to ruby throat. Really need to see that color to be certain. The female black chin. Uh, and I'm sure the male does this too, although I've only observed it in the female, tends to be to um, do this characteristic tail pumping while feeding. So if she's not perching, if she's just sipping while she's hovering, then her tail is pumping pretty significantly. Uh, and you combine that with the long bill, and you can be pretty certain that you have a female black chin hummingbird. Here's the range map of the black chin. It's probably the most common um, widely distributed hummingbird in the West. Um, basically, it's as common in the West as the ruby throat is in the East, uh, but again, pretty much goes to the Western coast of Mexico in the wintertime normally, except for the few that come to the Gulf Coast. And then we have the pièce de résistance for winter hummingbirds. Uh, this is the buff-bellied hummingbird. Uh, so this hummingbird is much larger, almost twice as big as our uh, ruby-throated hummingbird with the buff belly, um, the completely different color gorget. Look at all the colors in that gorget. I saw turquoise and purple and navy blue and green and, uh, and the rufous in the tail. Um, there's no way to, to, <laughs> to mistake this bird for a ruby-throated ruby throated hummingbird, both the male and the female uh, look very similar. Um, and there are records of buff bellied hummingbirds in Louisiana every year. They also sound completely different than a, um, any of the other hummingbirds. So this is just a, a slow-mo of that, um, that craning that he was doing. We'll see all the colors in the, uh, in the gorget here. 
as he stretches in the tail. So there's acid green, looks like purple, navy blue, and turquoise, and a beautiful russet color of his tail. Just gorgeous. And of course the red bill too, to set it all off. This was a hummingbird that spent the winter with Joan Garvey in New Orleans, and I was lucky enough to spend a couple of hours in her yard um, taking pictures and video of this, this winter visitor. I have never had a buff-bellied hummingbird in my yard, unfortunately. Uh, what a bird, what a bird. Uh, buff bellies love tangles, and that's probably why I don't have buff bellies in my yard. I don't have enough tangles. They like that dense shrubbery, the, the fine colored shrubs, um, that kind of thing. And they love to hide. Um, and if you're lucky enough to have a buff belly, you'll notice that they sound completely different. Just because they're a bigger bird, um, the, the sound is a little bit, a little bit snappier, a little bit louder, and they actually do this sing, sing song. Um, kind of sound as well. Um, so you'll, you'll hear them as well as see them. The buff belly is unusual because although it, it breeds and occurs year round in Mexico, um, it's in migration, it flies, it goes north. Uh, so this map acknowledges that they are along all the, the basically the Gulf Coast of Texas and Louisiana. Uh, I sort of think this map implies that they're more common than they are. Um, there's while there certainly are records every year, um, there's, they're not, they're pretty exceptional to have. So um, it, it's really a special thing if you end up with a buck belly in your yard. There's one at Vita Woods uh, right now. If you've, you've probably seen Tom Finney, um, Tom Finney's photos and video of it. Recently, I think other people are taking pictures of it down there. Charlotte probably, I think, has taken some pictures down there. So that's kind of a treat. And occasionally, we get some other goodies, uh, like this one. This is the broad-billed hummingbird, um, as opposed to the broad-tailed. And this, this hummingbird, if you were to see this at your feeder, your first impression would be how dark it is. You notice there's no white on this adult bird. Um, this is a young male here, and it's got some splotching color to it. But look at that broad red bill, um, bright electric blue, gorget. Um, just looks completely different than any other hummingbird that we have normally around here. And this is a Mexican species. Uh, so you see even for now, it's got a big question mark here about um, migration and post green dispersal um, because we don't really know how widespread this bird is in the United States. Uh, it is a, a pretty much, pretty much a, a one a year if we're lucky kind of a bird in uh, Louisiana. And this occurred in, in Gail's yard um, for a short time. She had it banded. It came back the next day and then wasn't seen after that. So it moved on. Uh, this is a copy of um, Eric's uh, Winter Hummingbird Report. So Eric Johnson with Audubon, Louisiana is compiling a list of all the reported winter um, species of hummingbirds in, in Louisiana. And as of November 25th, he had, had uh, 307 reports, um, most of them being Rufus slash Allen. So 243 out of 307. A few black chin, buff bellied, some overwintering ruby throats, calliope, and then archilochus just means that there are people not sure if they're black chin or ruby throat, three broad tailed and one broad bill. And that just kind of goes along with what I was saying as far as the relatively relative scarcity of the different types of species. So if you do have a winter hummingbird in your yard, you might want to get it banded if the banders have enough um, time and energy to get to your house. Um, if you're not familiar, so uh, the hummingbirds have to be banded by a licensed certified bander and actually it's more difficult to get a license to, um, to band a hummingbird than it is for other birds just because they're so delicate. Um, so the, the, the cool thing about banding is that it absolutely proves that these birds can fly across the continent and return to the same location 
year after year, which is pretty phenomenal. This is what uh, Nancy set out to do in her research, and she has certainly proved that. So um, if you've never seen it done, the banders basically put a feeder into a, a cage uh, with a trap door that's controlled either manually or with a remote control. When the bird goes in to go to the feeder, they close the door on them and they reach in and carefully gather up the bird and put it in a bag. And then the bander will first um, determine the sex of the bird and put the band on the, uh, the leg of the bird. And then it'll be measured um, in the bill, the wing length, the tail, different aspects. It will be weighed. Uh, and then they'll check the bill for corrugations because the corrugations on the bill indicate that this is the hatch year bird. And that way, if it's found subsequently, they will know how many years that bird has lived. Every band is unique. Uh, so this is a ruby, uh, sorry, a rufous hummingbird that was banded in my yard a couple of years ago. And you can see the band installed on the leg of the hummingbird. Uh, each band has a letter and four numbers that is unique in all the world. And all of this data goes into a single database uh, so if that bird is recovered, um, people will know where and when it was banded. After the banding is done, um, the, the bander may put uh, just a dot of water-soluble paint on the head, and that's just so that we can keep track of these birds. If you have multiple birds in your yard, it's kind of nice to have one with a green dot and one with a yellow dot and one with a purple dot, and now you can keep track of which bird is which. Um, and know, you know, how they're, how they're interacting and what part of the yard that they're using. Um, so that's kind of a neat thing. And if you do have the banding done in your yard, usually you get to hold the hummingbird, which is a pretty neat experience. It feels like you're holding a feather with a heartbeat. It's wonderful. Recaptures are um, the most exciting thing about these banding projects. So Nancy actually had a rufous hummingbird that was banded in Thibodeau, Louisiana, recovered in British Columbia, and then recovered again in Thibodeau. So it proved beyond a doubt that these birds uh, do indeed travel across, across the country uh, successfully um, in their uh, winter and between their wintering and their breeding grounds. Uh, this is my little miracle. So this is the first rufous that was Banded in my yard in January of 20, 2006 by Nancy. She was recovered in my yard in 2007, 2008, and 2009. So she basically made it across the continent four years in a row back and spent the winter in the same shrub in my yard. And that is just amazing. When you kind of think about the spatial memory it must require this tiny bird um, to travel across the, the whole of North America. <laughs> is pretty mind boggling. Um, the winter, our hummingbirds are remarkably hardy. Uh, they certainly prefer the more tropical climates, um, which is the reason they go south in the first place, um, but they can handle the cold weather. Um, this was Miss Green and so named because she had a, uh, a when she was banded, she had a green dot uh, put on her head. Um, she, this is during a snowfall in January of 2018 in, uh, in my yard in, in Ponchatoula. And uh, I pretty much had to keep the, the feeders warm for her, but she survived just fine. But the, but the fire spike is still even blooming. <laughs> so banding, of course, tells us if they, if they, um, if they get a bird when, in its hatch year, uh, they know how long the bird lives. Um, it, the sources that I've read state that as many as nine out of 10 hummingbirds die in their first year. So there's a, a significant mortality rate in that first year just because those uh, migration processes are so strenuous. Ruby throated hummingbirds live about three to five years on average, um, when the record is for a broad tailed hummingbird in North America at 12 years. If you do see a winter hummingbird between November 15th and February, um, we'd like to know. So Eric Johnson, as I said, is the one to notify. You can send him an email. Um, he'd like to know the location, the species, if it's male or female, and then your first observed date. And then if you, it stays with you, he'd also like to know the date that it was last observed. 
Uh, this data all goes into his database and he's been tracking this for several years. He took it over from the previous one. So it's been, it's been documented now for a number of years. There's also, if you are a Facebooker, um, there's a Winter Hummingbird Facebook page. It's Winter Hummingbirds of the Eastern US. It's a great place um, for you to post uh, photos or video if you have questions about the birds that you're seeing. Um, you can get some um, information about identification. So how do you get uh, winter hummingbirds to come to your yard? Um, so the best thing to do is to leave some feeders up where you can see them. Uh, you want to keep them clean and you want to space the feeders out so that if you, you want to have enough feeders for every bird and then one extra. Um, so if you've got two birds, then have at least three feeders out. And uh, those little individual feeders are really good for winter hummingbirds, I found. Um, and if it is, um, if, if it does snow or get, we get a hard freeze, you might want to bring the feeder in at night and bring it out back out first thing in the morning, um, basically at first light. Um, or you can put it near a, um, an incandescent light bulb uh, to keep it warm. And they do have, you know, some people in Pennsylvania and Arkansas and different places further north have winter hummingbirds and they've concocted all kind of heated feeders. Um, really not necessary here in Louisiana because our freezes don't really last that long. Uh, so if you just um, um, put out the feeder in the morning, then your bird should be fine. You want to have some cover plants. So uh, hummingbirds like the evergreen plants um, for protection. So live oaks or the semi-green, semi-evergreen oaks like water oaks and willow oaks and that kind of thing that retain most of their leaves are great for um, hiding hummingbirds. They also attract lots of little insects that they'll eat. Um, Yopon uh, holly and other hollies are great because they retain their their leaves, they also attract insects, little tiny insects. And then your exotics like azaleas, camellias, ligustrum, and citrus um, are also evergreen, broadleaf evergreens, and they're great for um, providing cover. Uh, this is the photo of um, my one little wintering hummingbird this year who loves to stay hidden deep in my azalea bushes, uh, which is great for him for hiding and hard for me for taking pictures. <laughs> Everything has a stick in the way. You also can uh, plant some plants that bloom into the, the fall and into the winter. Um, some of them will are a little bit more cold hardy. Some might die, might die back at the first hard frost. But here's a couple of really good ones. The tall orange abutilon is wonderful. The ugly shrimp plant or winter shrimp, which it, I think it's beautiful. So. Uh, coral honeysuckle um, will bloom really almost 12 months of the year in Louisiana. Turk's cat tends to be a little bit more um, cold uh, sensitive. And then the fire spike is definitely cold sensitive. But we get down to 32 degrees and it pretty much turns black. So it needs some protection. If you've got a south wall where you can provide some protection, you can keep it blooming for a long time. Just the act of feeding other birds and having bird activity in your yard um, may actually attract hummingbirds, winter hummingbirds to your yard. Um, so, you know, have your feeder stations out and have some, some, um, some activity going on. Um, all that might get the attention of any wintering hummingbirds in the area who might show up to see what's going on and what's interesting, see if there's anything good to eat. Uh, I, I would, I would say that that's probably the case for my son. So this is an aerial view of my son's house in Ponchatoula. Uh, this is his yard. It is literally a postage stamp yard. There's nothing, no plants in the front, uh, grass, a couple of hawthorns right by the door. This is his backyard, which has a little patio and grass and no plants at all. He has had four winter hummingbirds so far this year. So right now, uh, within the last week or so, he's posted a picture of this archilocus, probably a ruby throat and a rufous type hummingbird in his yard. So sometimes it's just 
So with that, um, my advice is to start looking, start listening, uh, put out a feeder, keep your eyes out. And if you do see any winter hummingbirds, you want to report your sightings so that we can keep track of them, and understand more about these wonderful little birds. And I'm going to stop sharing and see if there are any questions.